thoughts, anything that's applicable to what you've built, um, feel free to uh, stop and interject. So the first thing I have to confess, this is not a talk for developers, and this is not a talk for designers. This is really a talk for builders. Um, in, a, in a lot of ways, whether you program, whether you're on the design, the front end, the back end, we're all building different applications that are being used by other people. And so everything we use, everything we build is used by a human. So however you interact with that, um, just, it's something to think about is how is it being used, how is it being, being consumed. So I'm Caleb Wright, I work um, at Fabric Agency. I work with three traditional designers. So I get a lot of Photoshop comps. I try to, you know, stay ahead of that. And uh, we usually try to work um, from the beginning to mix design and development throughout the process. There's not this, this disconnect. So the first part is, let's, let's make a decision. You know, biscuits or cornbread, it's a, it's a hard thing to choose from. Um, so as humans, uh, if you notice, we like to compare things. We like to comparison shop. We like to find the best deal. Uh, and we think we're pretty good at it. You know, we think we're making an informed decision about where we get our products. But in reality, we're only good at comparing things that are very similar. So if you find two similar products, it's easy to compare the features, it's easy to make a decision. You're not as good at comparing things that are different. So if you're comparing, you know, apples and oranges, that's easy because they're two fruits. But if you compare an apple to a car, it's a little different. So there's a book I would highly recommend if you, um, if you want to get it called Predictably Irrational by Dan Harrelly. He talks about how we're not only irrational in our behavior and in our decision making, but he can predict it. And so he goes through lots of different scenarios. Um, it's a really good read. So the scenario that he pulled, um, I'm gonna pull from the book, is about choosing your magazine subscription. And this is a real life example. So we have two options. You can get the internet only subscription for $59, or you can get the print and internet subscription for $125. Pretty straightforward. Do I want to read it online or just in print? You know, the second option is a little more than double than the first. So it's easy to decide. And from his surveys, the results are, you know, 68 people chose, you know, the first option, 32 people <coughs> chose the second option. So we're going to throw in another option, something that, you know, helps you kind of think about it. So we've got the internet only subscription for 59, the print only for 125 or the print and internet subscription for 125. So obviously the third one is a little better than the second one, it's the same price, and you get print and internet. So the results are a little different now. 16 people chose the first one, no one chose the second one, and 84 people chose the third one. So let's think about, you know, why does this happen? Why do people kind of shift to that? So according to him, options two and three are easy to compare. You know, you get for the same price, you get more of one than the other. So what happens is, people forget about option one. You're comparing the two similar ones, the other options kind of outside of that fall to the background. <clears throat> so the conversation in your mind could go something like, well for the same price you get twice as much in number three as in number two. Option three is obviously better than option two. But what about option one? You kind of forget about it. <laughs> So designing how we think nudges users down a path. So when we think about um, presenting options to users, sometimes we can influence them and kind of push them down a path, um, whether that's for monetization, whether that's for direct them to a higher quality um, input, you can kind of nudge and shift people down paths. Do we have any comments or observations about that? So the next part is, Let's direct the user. Also known as, please hold my hand while crossing the street. I have a two-year-old, we do this all the time. <laughs> and if it'll go. And I think Speaker Deck broke. Did it go out? 
Yeah. So there should be a cable right uh, run up the internet cable right up the cable. Oh, okay. Plug right in uh, hang on. Bear with us one second. I apologize for the fact that that's all the same, folks. So, your app is complex, we all know that, but the user doesn't need to know this. And so there are ways we can simplify it so that the users aren't um, seeing this. So one quote that I like to use is, simplicity is not about volume, it's about clarity. Um, Joshua Porter is a big UX guy, if you follow him on Twitter. Um, it really emphasizes that to make things easy to use, it, it's not about fewer options, it's about how clear it is. So building, one of the things that um, we discovered is that something to think about is building a form is kind of like designing a traffic intersection. The user knows where they want to go, they approach an intersection, but they just need some help getting there. If you give too much direction, well that's confusing. If you give not enough, this is an actual intersection in Europe where some cities are taking out all traffic signs. Whether that's good or bad, we'll kind of see. Sometimes it's actually a little bit better. We have to find the balance between saying too much and saying too little. Ask for what you're, so the next part is ask for what you're looking for, not what you need. So the difference between a half calf and a half calf, a little different. So as a background, New Marketplace is a product built by Fabric. So we um, branched out and built our own product, kind of pulling in some uh, bootstrapping to, to install in different chambers of commerce websites. And members can create offers to each other, and uh, they're written in what we call a daily deal style, so $120 for a one-year gym membership, say 50%. It's all self-contained, so they just they can do it themselves. We used to ask in the form for the offer description. Pretty straightforward, what's the description of your offer? And we got things like $85 for 15% off the entire Ribbit gift album collection. It doesn't even make any sense. but. <laughs> This is what people actually put in. So we have to kind of work with it. So we're gonna pivot. Now we ask for different things. We ask for what are you selling? How much are you selling it for? And what is the retail price? A little bit more friendly, easier to read. So we get things like $50 for CPR first aid combo course, $49.99 for full service private office. Much more easy to read and much more straightforward. We still had some bad ones, but you know, they're a lot fewer. So, so we move on to be closed-minded, also known as uh, how to be a square and think inside the box at the same time. Uh, so let's, uh, let's imagine this. So users go in to create an offer, but their mind goes blank. It's a form. They don't know what to, what to fill in the form. This is based on um, some of our feedback. So when it's too open-ended, sometimes they get lost. Sometimes they bail. They don't know what to do. So we introduced um, suggested offers. So you choose a category, there are pre-written offers ready for you, you can just click and go straight through. So this is the example, <clears throat> you choose a category, on the left hand side are four pre-written offers, you can just choose one of those or create your own. And it pre-fills it, you can change it, you can change the pricing. This tells the user what we're looking for, so they, they don't really have to think about it. And it also discourages offers that don't fit the mold. So the guy that's offering a dollar for free cons consulting, which isn't really an offer, may not decide to create it because it doesn't fit the mold of the other ones. <clears throat> so next part is we want to sell the do, not the what. Also known as, does that even make sense? It was 4 a.m. when I wrote this, so we'll just keep going. <laughs> so we'll look at, let's look at some advertisements from Lowe's. <clears throat> This is a screenshot of a commercial. The guy's destroying his deck. And all of a sudden, he's got a new deck and the, you know, great looking grass. It uh, looks great. So if they advertise sledgehammers, we'd have a lot of broken decks. But one thing they do is they sell the project, not the product. So they're not selling the sledgehammer. They're not selling the stain as much as the build a deck, replace your old deck, here put in a new one, and you know what, Lowe's is here, we have um, 
So we have everything you need to, to build your deck. So the idea is to give people ideas and recipes, and by the way, you can find that on Isle 9. And if you watch kind of commercials, they'll, they'll really you know, sell like, the, what's the big picture? What can I do with this? The details, are what they actually sell is a little different. So the, the one-two combo, also known as two nostrils are better than one. We can debate about that one. Uh, let's say you decide to set up an ad on your website. So, you know, this is an example from YouTube. Big ad, um, whatever reason, you gotta put the big ad up there. Got it. Someone says, hey, we need to tell people this is an advertisement. They may think it's an actual video, but we need to say, it's an advertisement. So let's say we put up, you know, some text up there. This is an advertisement. Got it. Uh, someone else says, hey, we should be able to close this thing because it's big and intrusive. So we put up a close button up there. Good to go. But are we done with both up there? So we'll do the super combo. <laughs> and this is actually from YouTube. What they do is interesting because they put close ad in there. It's not only, it's combining the form and function of, hey, this is an ad, but really it's, it's still a close button at the same time. So when you, as you build projects, as you build these things, you know, think about different opportunities to combine a little bit of informative education with something that's functional. You know, how can we combine these things, educate the users, direct them down the path? Uh, so better no no messages, also known as uh, don't question your mother while in timeout. It's just not a good time. <laughs> uh, let's say we have a button, only for those with the correct privileges. So this is something from Member Marketplace, um, and you can click on it, but you need the right permission to uh, actually do anything with it. So here's the button called Make an Offer. Uh, we show it to all the users, whether they have permission or not. Um, it kind of leads them down a path of there's the button there that you could make an offer. <coughs> so you could say, you know, after they click on it, please sign in. They sign in. Then they come back. Oh, permission denied. So not only have you asked the user to sign in, which they have to remember their username and password or register, by the time they get back to it, well, it's denied. So why did, you know, there's a little bit of frustration there because they're thinking, why did you ask me to sign in? If I can't do anything after I sign in. <coughs> so, and what is this, what is the permission that I actually need? So, the idea is to meet the users where they are with specific messages. So we actually tailored, there's four or five different versions of the same button that we use um, to, to meet them where they are. So if they're not logged in and they click on the button, Please sign in to continue. In order to respond, you must be a business administrator and have active membership in this chamber. So we're not only saying, hey, you need to log in, but kind of give them a heads up. Hey, the next step, you actually need to be have some privileges before you continue on. It avoids some of the frustrations. Something a little better. Please sign in as an administrator of your business. So if you need to be logged in with certain privileges, and let's say you click on it and you are logged in, you don't have permission. Uh, we actually give them the name of the person they should contact within their own organization to, to follow up with. So if you don't have permission, you know, don't, don't call us. You should really contact this guy because th this is the guy that can give you permission. So the idea is to provide a path for the user to change it themselves. Do we have any like comments or observations? It's kind of a whirlwind of stuff. So, so to, to determine the best types of messages or buttons to show people, would you do any split testing or user testing or uh, any, any sort of analysis on um, like click paths or anything like that? Yeah, we actually I don't have any hard data, but it was one of those intuitive kind of gut approaches of there. I. If we back up, our original approach was to hide the buttons because they don't have permission. But we realized that it looked like an empty page and it didn't educate people that 
they can actually continue on and do something with this. And so by introducing the buttons, then we thought, you know, we really need to like kind of give them a path. But yeah, it would be interesting to know kind of what the, what, we don't have enough hard data behind it. But. <coughs> uh, so the next part, waiting, 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 also known as free moments to play Angry Birds. So we have a symptom. Um, we have duplicate database entries. So this is something we found, you know, one day in a half seminar, perhaps 20 people, someone put it in twice. Um, so we, if we start, you know, pulling this apart, there are multiple reasons this could, this could have been put in there. Um, so one solution to prevent this from happening is to add validations. So if you, in your Rails code, if you add you know, you can validate the description, make sure it's unique, scope it to the user, so that they're not entering in the same thing twice. That's the thing with, uh, by doing this is though, it, sometimes it's misleading because if the user clicks it once and then clicks again, sometimes they'll only see the second message. They don't always see the first message that, hey, what you entered in was actually successful. They just get the, you, enter, you submitted a twice message. And so to them, sometimes uh, you don't always know if you're that user, did it actually go through? It just said it was submitted twice. I have no idea where I am. <coughs> so another solution is to add better messaging. So, you know, after they submit it, we see you, they've already entered this. Um, you can then provide a link to the original one. So if they do enter it twice and they're reassured that. Okay, here's the, the first one. Um, and you know, make it nice. Please click on the button just one time. But does that really solve the problem? So let's think about the behavior. Um, the user may have double clicked on the button. I know it's 2012, people still double click on buttons on the web. Uh, it happens. Or they may have been impatient. So if we look at this database record, the difference is about four seconds. So that could have been anything from you know, a slow uh, query on the database. It could have been, you know, hey, I clicked on it, but there was a network problem, so I clicked on it again. So another um, solution to this is to try to prevent multiple clicks in JavaScript. Um, it hides the, you may only do this once error, so they see the actual first error instead of the second one. And add an indicator that tells the user that it's doing something. So that's why, you know, spinners are important, um, just to show like, hey, something's working, even though we all know it doesn't do anything. It's just, you know, nice to look at. But it, it, it does actually reassure the user that everything that it entered in the form has been submitted and is processing and you know it's doing something. So you don't have that kind of empty wait time of, is it going to work? So here's the little uh, coffee scripts piece that we pulled out, uh, a function called One Click Pony that um, you pass in just a button and a callback. Um, and we use, uh, I like to use uh, CSS classes to kind of define state. So if the class has a disabled state on it, then uh, it doesn't process it again. Uh, it'll okay. pin the spinner after it. Um, using classes of state is also nice because then you can style the button differently and use it kind of as a dual purpose um, piece. So one symptom, the duplicate database entries may have multiple problems with multiple solutions. So it's important to approach it from the, you know, one approach is the database side, one approach is to say, okay, is our server fast enough? Um, or is it, you know, approaching from the user side in the front, maybe they just don't understand that they only need to click it once, or that, you know, there's, there are multiple angles to attack um, kind of the same problem. So, takeaways. I realize that this is much a much shorter talk than I thought. But, get to know your irrational user, um, there are predictable ways that we can kind of direct users down a path. Uh, we can provide a path um, instead of a wall, instead of a barrier. And ask what you're looking for. So 
please give us a description of your product. Um, and solve problems from multiple angles. So if we look at the, the design side of you know, providing a spinner, the, des uh, the user experience side of uh, preventing double clicks, the database side of adding validations, that one problem can be addressed in multiple ways um, efficiently. Some of them are much less time consuming than others. So, we have your questions, answers, observations. Does this kind of resonate with things, or what do y'all, what do y'all think? Yeah, uh, I was, I was going to ask, uh, do do you use any uh, experimental? I, I think I think kind of already touched on it uh, with the split screens and whatnot, but um, um, that kind of was an amateur UX. UXer um, back when I was on the business side of things. Yeah. And uh, one, one of the things that, that my group and I, uh, we, we used to kind of, to kind of baseline things was uh, for some of those Nielsen heuristics. Um, and so we, we take everything from that. Um, and then we, we take some, there's some, some good things that uh, some guys were doing at uh, Get Satisfaction uh, with more scientific approaches. And then uh, I don't know if anybody follows the uh, the signal versus noise blog, and they, they have some similar things um, where they actually collect data um, on, on some of the uh, some of the pages that they're testing. So I was just wondering, um, from a user experience uh, perspective, how, how exactly um, do you do you come up with the, uh, the decisions, or is it just a gut instinct? Yeah, for for a lot of things um, that we do. Sure. Um, when you're, I think whenever you're refining an idea, you can easily collect data, kind of have a baseline. Um, for for this member marketplace, because it was such a new product and we're iterating very quickly, um, we went with a lot of um, feedback from customers to find problems. So there's there's kind of a dual approach. I would love to you know pull in some data, but that that feedback loop of getting asking customers and people that actually use it. Um, is, is vital too. Um, so it's, there's a good like combination there. Um, we have some good um, because it's so <coughs> chambers of commerce. They're dealing with support from the members themselves. So we have you know individual contacts that kind of collect a lot of support requests, and they can tell us how they solve the problem. And a lot of times, how they solve the problem, we can be a step ahead of them to make it easier. Uh, earlier you were saying that you work with a lot of designers and you try to kind of stay out ahead of their final designs and try and work with them to, to figure out how it all works together. Uh, but if you don't have a UX type person and it's pretty much just you, do you have any tips for uh, coming up with a good design, kind of anticipating the stupid things you use when you're going to do that kind of stuff? Yeah, so. Inspiration is always a great place to find. So if you um, searching uh, dribble, following UX guys on um, on Twitter is great for kind of some of the details. Um, yeah, a lot of it. If you look at there's a something we could look at littlebigdetails.com is a is a really neat website. Because um, they break down something simple. This is a so on Kickstarter, the email sign up field proposes related email provider that it thinks you may have. So if you mistype Gmail, it puts in this little message Did you mean blank? So, by you know, a lot of kind of inspiration comes from following people and you know, constantly reading and consuming, seeing what's, what's popular. And what actually works? So I always love this this site. Well, what are your thoughts on uh, visual design pattern sites? You know, where you could take I don't know. You know, they've got a catalog of various ways to approach different different types of problems, or you know, widgets or controllables, or. Are those uh, helpful or are those? It depends on 
to me, it depends on the, the project and how quickly it needs to be built. Sometimes they're nice to see what what else is out there, and if you don't if you don't have the designer or someone to design it for you, you can you can pull from those. Um, sometimes they're too cumbersome or they over design a solution. So it kind of it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I like to look at them sometimes, but that's about it. Do you find it makes more sense to just start building something together and? it up and kind of start with something and then kind of work your way through a design process as you go more than doing a whole big bunch of thought and user assessment, build a big design plan and then go and what, what tends to be better from when you're trying to make these such subtle user changes, yeah. user experience changes? Usually um, I like to you know just pull out like a big whiteboard and just kind of write it all out and create the scenarios for all the different users. Um, But yeah, that uh, that typically helps to just like kind of laying it out. The the I think the traditional way is what they call waterfall design. So you take you know a wireframe, Photoshop comp, and you literally take that and you know build out a website, which which has its pros and cons. If you're doing the client based work, that's nice because they approve it, and what they approve you don't change, so you can always go back to that. And uh, but if you're doing like something for yourself, it's much better, I think, just to like try to like get it out there, try to experiment, and see what works and what doesn't. Um, if you're trying to do like a whole application yourself, a lot of times <coughs> there's so many parts to it, you need to tackle everything a little bit and then build up from there versus taking too much thought or too much time on one section over another. So you mentioned you know having different kinds of users, so. Um, I mean, in your mind, what are those different kinds? Like the the one who totally gets it, the one who thinks like me, the one who's an idiot, the one who's really an idiot. I mean, what are your yeah. what, are, what are those so categories? The the ones that um, they're always the ones that do what you want them to do. So you want to encourage them and keep them motivated. There's always the person that never reads anything <laughs> and is always frustrated because they never read it. And then there's someone that reads everything and takes it literally. And so if you're they're following it to a T. And that, you know, the, so we're talking about, you know, designing forms and asking for input. There, those three kind of people that we just kind of try to account for. And there's always someone that puts in something that's way too long and it breaks your design and you always have to, you know, back up. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, going back to the, the little big details, yeah. uh, do you know of any, uh, I hate to say all inclusive, but uh, any gems that could do uh, em emulate some some similar functionality to, uh, to those elements up there. I don't know of any gems offhand. There or, or, or yeah, for uh, there, there was a gem for that. The uh, the email validator was actually the JavaScript library on Hacker News a couple of weeks ago, I think. So you mm -hmm. can probably find it by searching Hacker News. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that one is out there. Um, I don't know of anything offhand that it's also it, these are all very unique solutions. So sometimes you know it's ahead of the curve. Any other thoughts or things that you all have seen kind of out there that um, is inspiring or that you like the way? The interface worked on it, or it's easy to use. We can do some show and tell. Well, I, I, I like how, how Amazon. Uh, I don't I don't know if they still do it, but uh, when you log in, they would have on the button um, click here to like securely log in instead of just click here and just instead of just having log in. Yeah. And then after you push the button, it would deactivate the button so you couldn't uh, resubmit the information again. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, w I was kind of thinking about what you were talking about with the, uh, with the swirly and, and the error messages popping up. Um, so I was just thinking, well, shit, you got a good validation in the database, why not just deactivate the button? Then they can't, they can't do any more damage. <laughs> right, yeah. But, but with the validation, they'll, they'll end up seeing the second message that, hey, you already entered this. And they'll never see the first one. Oh, they don't okay. click. Um, but yeah, that button is, is nice because it's, you know, click here, it's pretty obvious. 
but it reinforces the security. So for those that are more conscious of it or want to feel secure, that you know, kind of directs them down that path too. So these are uh, influencers, a uh, little big details, predictably irrational by Dan Airely. He also has two other follow-up books. Um, I'd recommend the first one, um, and then before you read the other two, then uh, Joshua Porter is a good G UX guy. Um, he'll dissect things like the Airbnb landing page, um, kind of pull out the messaging, um, little, little tweaks that um, change things up. So, I heard that we're doing picks. So, my pick is the Violetta <laughs> Mocha. So, if you're a coffee drinker and you like espresso, but you don't want to get the big machine that takes up the whole counter and costs three or four hundred bucks, you can get the Violetta Mocha. They even sell like Harris Teeter. It's got a little pot of water underneath. You, you can grind your beans, put it in there, sit on the stove, you know, five or ten minutes. It'll boil through and you've got a, a nice cup of espresso. So, if there are any coffee drinkers out there, it doesn't take up, I can tuck it away too. Right? <laughs> Alright, All right, well thank you Ken. Thank you all. Thank you.